I want us to turn in our Bibles. You're going to want to keep, uh, probably keep your finger in the Bible. Two spots we'll be going back and forth to there. You'll see we have two scriptures. And uh, we'll be looking around those scriptures to find out what God is uh, wanting to tell us this morning about these two journeys that we're looking at. But I'd like for us to turn, first of all, to Luke chapter 2. And if we stand for the reading of God's Word. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And then turned back to Matthew chapter 2. And I want to read the first two verses in that chapter to kind of get us started. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Father, bless your word today. And help us to enter this journey that these two groups took. And apply it to our lives. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> There's a big war going on in our nation today. The big players in Washington are trying to make a big distinction between the rich and the poor. Dollar amounts and lifestyles are thrown around to determine where the line should be drawn. But one of the things I like about the Christmas story is that God doesn't draw a line. He doesn't make a distinction. The rich and the poor stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. They stand on level ground at the foot of the manger. But through the shepherds and the wise men, we see that this was God's view from the very beginning, even in that stable. The stories of these visitors are well known to almost everyone when the Christmas story is told. In fact, there are similarities in the journeys of these two groups of visitors. I think we can learn a lot about how we are to follow God when we look at these similarities. What is it that these two groups of people did on their journey to Bethlehem? To the Bethlehem. How did they get there? What do we need to learn from them? <clears throat> well, I want you to notice one thing. First, the thing is they were interrupted. They were interrupted. Uh, if you go back to the, shep the shepherds, it's pretty obvious how they were interrupted. They're, they're going about their daily business. They're watching the sheep. They're taking care of everything with the sheep and, and doing everything that they normally do. And then... All of a sudden, a big host of angels appears to the, the shepherds. Just show, shines up the whole sky with light. They don't know how to handle this. It kind of scares them. In fact, the first thing the angel says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Think if you were there and the, doing your own thing, watching the sheep out in the countryside. You're getting ready to settle down for the evening. You've got everything settled down. All of a sudden, this big old light comes up. It interrupts everything that they were doing. It interrupts their normal lifestyle. It interrupts the, the things that they had planned. You say, well, preacher, how did it interrupt the wise men? Well, they're doing their own thing also back in the east. And all of a sudden, they're studying, and it says in, in uh, a lot of people think that they were uh, almost amateur astrologers. A lot of the wise men back then would read the stars. And they were looking at the stars. And they noticed this one that was west of them. You see, they said they saw it from the east. They were in the east. And they saw this star in the west, and they're thinking, that, that's not on any of our charts. We've, we've never seen that star before. Let me, let's check our books. And, and they literally knew what that star was about because they had the prophecies. 
They were students of the prophecies. I don't know how they got them, but they were students of the prophecies. Because they said, we've seen, we, we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship the king of the Jews. Okay? So they knew something about the prophecies about the Messiah. This interrupted everything they were doing. I think that when they saw that star, they said, hey guys, we need to go check this out. And they dropped everything that they were doing and went to see that star. See, they were interrupted in the normal things that they would normally do. When I look at that, I think God doesn't work on our schedule. Have you ever noticed that? you got something planned, and all of a sudden, God interrupts it. God interrupts the time that you were going to have. <coughs> well, one of the things that I've noticed <coughs> is He always comes at the right time, in the right place, in the right way. You ever notice that? <coughs> we think, you know, things should happen a certain way. We think that things, things should happen in a certain time frame, in a certain time schedule. And then God comes along and says, no, wait a minute, i got a better way of doing it. This is where we're going to do it. You're going to change it right here. You're going to change what you're doing right now. I know what you've got planned, but i got something else planned. I'm working behind the scenes. You need to follow it my way because there's an ultimate plan here that you may not see yet, but it's the one that's going to work out. It seems that when God chooses to work in our lives, most of the time He comes unexpectedly. Many of you know the story of my call to preach. Uh, I was already in college. Freshman in college. Brand new in college. I'd already started my college track. And then a revival service. First month in college, I had my life planned out. First month in college, God calls me to preach. In an audible voice, He says, preach. Because I had my life planned out, it took me a couple weeks to even accept that. I didn't want that. I didn't want to do that. I mean, my family had... Had, I had the, the advantages of my family to go on the track I was going. I had, I had contacts to go in the way that I was going. And, and, and I, had, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And now, this? But after almost 30 years of ministry, I know that God knew better. I, knew that, I know now that God's way was the right way. But He interrupted what I wanted to do. <clears throat> a lot of times somebody, uh, somebody will come into your life. You'll be doing something and someone will come up and say, no, I need, man, there's really something I need to talk to you about. I'm really having problems. And, you now, let's be honest. A lot of times when that comes our way, we go, Why don't you wait until, until I don't have anything else to do? I mean, I gotta, I gotta do this and I gotta do this and I gotta take care of this and I got this scheduled and I gotta get to, I gotta get to this appointment and I gotta do this and and they stop us right there and it's just like, man. But think about what's happening. We ask God for opportunities, yet we don't like it when the opportunities come when we don't want them. But most of the time opportunities come when, we're not, when we don't want them. But when we, see, when we stop and we say, okay, I'm going to stop right now. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen. I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to what God wants me to do in this situation. I'm going to be, I'm going to be late for that. And me, I hate being late somewhere. If I've got an appointment, I'm one of these that wants to be there 10 minutes ahead of time. When we we started Sunday school at 9 30 in my home church. We were never there later than 9. If we were there later than 9, we were late. That's just the way, that's just the way I was brought up. And so when, when I would when, when I would go to work, when I started working, when I would go to work, I'd be there ahead of time. I've always done that. Because I don't want to be late. But 
God's teaching me when these opportunities come, when, when there are people that He is wanting to deal with, that He's wanting to minister to. And He wants to use me for that. And He brings them my way. He says, okay, you stop right now what you're doing and you take care of this because this is more important than what you're doing. And that's what happened here. Think of the calling of the disciples. The first four were out fishing. They're out doing their daily work. They're out supporting their families. And Jesus walks by and He turns to them and He says, Follow me. You mean i got to stop what I'm doing and follow you? It doesn't say that they ever said that. Here's what it says that, that happened. Jesus walked by and He said, Follow me. He keeps going. It says that they dropped their nets right there. And they followed Him. It's almost like it was an immediate response. He interrupted their life. Their lives, but they knew that this was bigger than what they were doing. So they followed him. He comes up to Matthew, Levi, and some of the and some of the and, uh, interpretations of it. Same person, he's tax collector. He's sitting there collecting taxes. He's got people coming there. He's got a line of people there. He's got a line waiting of people to pay him taxes. He's, he's looking at those people and he's thinking, man, I'm going to make, uh, I'm gonna pay, make, make 10 denarii off that person and I'm going to make 2 denarii extra off that person. I'm going to make about 5 off that person. He's counting up in his head what he's going to make. He's got all these people waiting for him. Jesus comes by. He looks up and sees Jesus and Jesus says, follow me. It says that he basically got up from his seat and followed him. Stop what he was doing and followed him. Can you imagine all those people sitting there? The, the tax collector has just left. They probably had a party. Because they didn't have to pay their taxes that day. <laughs> but Matthew knew that there was something bigger. That there was something better. The most famous interruption we hear of in Scripture is Saul. We later know him as Paul. On the road to Damascus. <clears throat> to get those dirty, rotten Christians, take them back in chains, to prison, some to death. He's got authority to arrest these people. He's on his, he's on his horse, and they're going back, and all of a sudden, a light comes in front of him, and he's thrown off his horse, and he's blinded. And God said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, Who are you, Lord? And in that moment, Saul's life is changed forever. But he had to be interrupted because Saul would not have done it on his own. He had to be interrupted. And we are interrupted. That's the way God works. We need to be constantly alert to the working of the Holy Spirit in God. We need constantly be alert to how He is working in our lives and, and working through our lives because sometimes we miss it. I want to tell you, we have, we have times where we open up the altar for prayer and there are some people who say, I don't even pray. Even though God's been showing me things, I don't even pray about it. And it never comes to us again. Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes we have an opportunity, it comes to us like that, and then we never have it again. Sometimes we have people come our way that we've been praying for. Oh, I've been praying for, I've been praying for this family member to be saved. And they come to us and they say, they call us on the phone and they say, you know, I really need to talk to you about something. And we say, well, you know, I'm on, I'm on my way to do something now. Why don't you call me later? And they never call us back. And what just happened? God tried to interrupt us. God tried to answer our prayer. And we were too busy. And we were too busy. We miss out on so much because of that. We are frustrated when we're interrupted, when we should view the interruptions as opportunities. I want you to change how you view interruptions to your schedule now. From now on, I want you to see interruptions that come your way as opportunities. As opportunities. 
Because God never does anything by accident. And nothing comes into our lives by accident. It is there for a purpose. But I want you to notice this. The interruptions wouldn't have made a difference if they had not taken it further. See, because not only were they interrupted, they listened. They listened. The shepherds out in the field, they're given this great, grand message. Unto was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And when they listened, they listened and they heard the message. They had to hear what was being said in order, to, in order to experience what was going on. The wise men, they got into they got into the prophecies and they knew the prophecies and they listened to what the prophecies were saying. And because of that, everything else happened. But they had to listen. I don't think we're good listeners today. I really don't. Uh, again, it may have uh, something to do with we're just too busy to listen <clears throat> to what's going on. How many times have we seen <clears throat> kids trying to gain the attention of their parents and the parents are too busy to give them the time of day because they're trying to work and they're trying to do things to give the kids a better life when the kids would rather have them listen to them than all the things that they give them. We have a problem listening because we all have our own agendas of how things should be. I think that's why listening is such an elusive art. We have an agenda. You know, <clears throat> we got the things going on in Washington now. We got President Obama in the White House. And we've got the Democrats and the Republicans, and, <clears throat> and everybody's saying, "Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cross this line, and I'm not going to cross that line." You know what's happening? Is nobody's listening to anybody else. Everybody's got their own agenda. And heaven forbid we should listen to the people. Everybody's out there. And when nobody listens to anybody else, nothing gets done. Nothing gets done. <coughs> but listening is the only way that we can really find out what God wants of us and for us. Only as we listen to Him can we really know Him. Can we really know His way. In fact, Listening is the essence of faith. In Romans 20, 17, it says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. If we don't listen, we, we really can't understand, we really can't gain what God is wanting to say to us. <clears throat> in Revelation, <clears throat> when they're talking about uh, in those first few chapters to the churches, there's a phrase that they use, which I think is so appropriate. I don't have it on the overheads. But the phrase goes, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now we come to church, and we've got everything on our mind, don't we? we you've got... You came to church this morning with a lot of baggage on your mind. It may be something that was going on last week. It may be something that's going to go on later on today. It may be something that wouldn't happen this morning. It's like the, the husband and wife that, that get up in the morning and the wife starts getting the kids ready and, and she's, got, she's got three or four kids that she's trying to just get dressed and get and feed and all this kind of stuff. And, and dad's in and he's reading his morning Sunday, Sunday morning paper getting ready for church and really getting spiritually ready for service and and she's just running hazard around. And then she's got to get herself ready. And then she's got to make sure that they don't snip and snap at each other. And, and she's all harried and all kinds of stuff going on. And they come to church and they sit in church. And he turns to her and he says, Honey, I don't understand why you can't worship. See, he didn't understand the baggage. But God does. And God said we need to, we need to calm ourselves down and, and we need to find out what's important and, and we need to make it so that we can really listen. <coughs> really listen. And husband, in that scenario, if he really wanted his wife to hear what God has to say, he would help with a couple of the kids. 
We need to, we need, we, we have all this baggage and, and we bring it in with us and, and it, it's hard for us to listen and, and we really need to work at it. We really need to, to really focus our thoughts on Him and listen. Because when we listen, we must be sure we are hearing what is said, not for just approval of our ways. Can I tell you, I counsel a lot of people. And when I counsel those people, when they come up to me for advice, a lot of times what I hear them saying is, and they don't say this outright, but what they're saying is, uh, could you tell me that God approves what I'm doing? A lot of times it comes across like this. Preacher, what do you think of this? Preacher, do you think this is right? Preacher, do you think I'm okay if I do this? Bottom line, that doesn't matter. I'm not, if I'm really listening, I'm not saying, okay, I'm going to hear that God approves of what I'm doing. Most of the time when I listen, I find out that God's got a better way of doing things than what I do. That He's got a better plan, and that's what I'm listening for. We've got to listen to what He wants for us. In John 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. See, they hear my voice. Do you hear God today? Do you hear Jesus today? This verse moves our listening from passive to active, which is what made the difference with the shepherds and the wise men. Because not only did they listen, they acted. They acted. The shepherds heard this message from God through the angels. And... You notice what they said in the, in the past of Scripture? They said, let us go see this thing that we've been told about. Let us go see what's going on. The wise men, when they came to King Herod, he said, we saw the star. We got the message. We heard the message. Now we've come to see this king. We've come to worship this king. They traveled probably hundreds of miles. To see this. See, they acted on it. They didn't just listen to it. The shepherds and wise men didn't just sit there and talk about what a wonderful message they just heard. <clears throat> that's, what I, that's what I think of when I, when I preach on Sunday morning. You see, we, we listen to messages Sunday after Sunday, and we never act upon what was addressed. You know how I know that? No one is at an altar. There's not very much ministry. We don't do the work during the week that God has called us to do. We, we, we hear a message and we'll go out and say, boy preacher, that was a good message. I really don't care if you thought it was a good message or not. What I care about is that the Word of God that He gave to me to give to you this week made a difference in your life. Are you going to do something about it? That's why I give you an action step at the end of every sermon. Are you going to do something about it? Or are you just going li to listen to it and talk about it? See, because nothing, uh, talking about things never got anything done. Ever. That's the problem we've got. In our government. That's the problem we've got in a lot of failing enterprises. They talk about it. But they don't do anything about it. This is not the way God meant for it to be. In James 2 verse 6. He says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Faith apart from works is dead. Our faith is not living if we're not practicing. James says if our faith is not acted upon, then it is powerless and it is useless. Our faith doesn't matter. It's not going to work if we don't act on it. If we don't act on it. James' whole argument wasn't that the work saved people. James' whole argument was if you really have faith, it ought to be acted out in your life. We ought to be able to see it. 
You say, well, I know I'm a Christian. I don't care if anybody else does or not. You better start caring if anybody else does or not. Because if they're looking at you and saying, if that person's not a Christian, I know why they say that. Because that's pretty, that's pretty big. Because when we act out our faith, people should be able to see it. People should be able to know by what we're doing, by, by the way that we're living, by the things that we are doing in people's lives, whether we are Christians or not, whether we really care or not. They acted on it. They went out, they went to the shepherds, went to the manger, and they saw the baby Jesus. The wise men, they left King Herod, and they went, and they saw, and they worshipped, and they gave to the baby Jesus. But it also requires a lot more from us. And God knows that. When we act upon what we hear, it requires a lot from us. <clears throat> That's why in Romans 12, 1, Paul says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service. You see, it takes a sacrifice. It takes all of us that we are in order to act upon what we've heard. That's what worship is all about. That's what, you know, we worship God here through music and we lift Him up and we focus on Him and we try to get our thoughts on Him and what He wants for us and, and try to listen to what He has to say to us. But worship outside of these doors is acting upon what we've heard. Is having faith with works. That's what that's about. You know, I put things... I put things for ministry opportunities in the in the bulletin every week. You know, it may be something about a community Christmas celebration, or it may be something about joining choir, or it may be something about starting a small group. We're going to start small groups. Uh, we're going to start small groups uh, the week following Easter in the church. We're going to try to reach out to as many people as we possibly can. I see us reaching out to hundreds of people through small groups. You know, I put that in the bulletin last week. I emphasized that last week. I put it up on the screen last week. I had one person ask me. I said, Preacher, you don't understand. You don't understand. No, I don't really understand your circumstances totally. But I do understand God. I do understand how God wants to work. And God wants to see people saved around you. And God wants to see your prayers answered about people that be saved. And are we really serious about it? Are we really serious about it? Are we really going to act on it? Are we really going to make the sacrifice for it? Because it's going to be a sacrifice. Are we willing to make the sacrifice to see the things that God wants done? If so, we need to act on our faith. And if we take the chance and we act on our faith, that's when we truly worship. Because I want you to see one final thing they did. They celebrated. And this is where the gospel really got started. They came, the wise men came, and they looked, and they saw. Now, I want you to move ahead. I want you to move ahead to Pentecost, 33 years later. Now, a lot of people probably haven't, haven't connected the wise men with Pentecost. But I want to take you ahead to Pentecost. The wise men get this message of the Messiah. They've seen the king born. They've seen this baby. They know there's something special about this baby. They've given these gifts to the baby Jesus. And now they go back home. What do you think they did when they got back home? They started talking about it. They started talking about what was going on. They started talking about what was happening. Now, 33 years later, Let's go to Pentecost. And I want you to notice in Pentecost, at Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, how many different nations are listed that were present at Pentecost. How do you think the message got out? How do you think it spread so far? This was before Paul and his ministry. The only ones that had ministered were Jesus and the disciples. And they only ministered in that little area right there. Where do you think all these people came from? Where do you think people, all these people had heard this message? I think it had something to do with wise men. I think they took this message with them. 
And the shepherds, when they got done, they said, you know, we got to go tell everybody we know about this. And so they went out and they just started telling everybody that they came in contact with. So all the people that were there, basically this was preparing the ministry for Jesus and his disciples because started, they started talking about this special child that was born. And word got around. You see, witnessing is just an outgrowth of our excitement from our celebration. Do we really get excited enough to go out and tell people about it? I want, I want to tell you, I, I'm, I, in case you didn't know, I'm a Colts fan. I know I keep that secret. But I watched their game last week. And I was, I was, and, and I told the Elwood and Bill this, I think. I, I was sitting there. They were down by 12 points. There's only about two and a half minutes left. And I almost turned off the TV. And I don't turn off the TV on a, on a coast football game. I just don't do it. <laughs> and I almost did. I thought, this is done. They were playing Detroit in Detroit. And all of a sudden, they got the ball and lucked through some long passes, and they got a touchdown. Now they're only down by five. But they only got about a minute and a half left. There's no way. And they hold Detroit to three downs. They get the punt. They come back down. I think there's still no way. And then there's a long pass that takes them to about the 11 yard line. They've only got about, I think it was like 20 seconds left or something like that. I mean, there's no way now. And they, they shoot that ball three times. He got past that ball three times into the end zone. They drop it every time and he overthrows it and can't get it. They're down to the fourth down. Four seconds. I'm on the edge of my seat. And you surely can verify this. They caught, Luck got that ball. He's scrambling. I think the game's over because they're going to get him. And all of a sudden, Avery comes across right in front of him, about five yards in front of him. He shovel passes that ball to him. He almost beats him into the end zone. Avery runs in the end zone. As soon as Avery crossed that line, they won that game. I shouted. I went, oh! They did it! And do you know, everybody I could tell after that, I went and told Cause that, that, that's exciting. I was excited about God. Because that's what witnessing is. Witnessing is getting excited about God. Enough to go tell people about it. Because there was something else that happened last week. Just a couple nights ago. I got home... Surely I said I'd gotten a call from somebody and, and I knew it was one of those interruptions and I knew that it was going to be a long phone call. And uh, it was somebody who had been a young person in this church come through our program, been in and out. He needed to talk. <coughs> he'd been in jail and I mean he'd been in prison. He'd been in and came out and he needed to talk. And I think I was on the phone with him for probably 30, 40 minutes. Listen to him tell a story, probably longer than that. Listen to him tell a story. And when we got to the end, I said, you know, what you really knew, need to do is you need to get rid of the old self. And you need to become the new self that God has for you. And we prayed over the phone. Can I tell you? That's what it's all about. Because that's exciting. And that's something to celebrate. And that's what we need to be telling people. And that's when it becomes real. And that's when it becomes worship. That makes it worthwhile. You know, 
we can't help but celebrate when we realize the reality of the event. You know, Christ the Savior is born. The Son of God, God Himself is born, came in flesh, full of grace and truth, to save us. It's not, dif it's not different. Yeah, the births are always, always promote celebrations. You know, you, you have a birth, and, and mom and dad and grandma and grandpa always have pictures. You don't even have to ask them. You don't, you say, well, how are things going? I've got to show you, i got to show you these pictures. They don't even wait. I mean, it's just like, you better be ready to see pictures. And you get ready to see all kinds of pictures. <laughs> Debbie's got something to show you if you want to see. Uh, it's not any different in the kingdom of God. Listen to this. Luke 15, 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner. Who repents? One child was born again. There's a celebration in heaven. Wouldn't it be great if somebody came to God that we would just celebrate? We would clap and we would cheer because somebody has come into heaven. That's what happens with the angels. There ought to be a celebration every time somebody turns their life over to God or gains a victory in this life. Once we realize that we're in the family of God, that should lift our spirits because Luke also in chapter 10 says this, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's not, it's not all about the power in us, but the source of the power that's in us that brings us joy. Our names are written down in heaven. I don't want to come up to heaven and God open the book and He says, Man, you did a lot in this world, but your name's not here. I would rather go up to heaven and have everything I did fail. But he look down and say, yeah, your name's right here. Come on in. Come on in. Wouldn't you? And we rejoice because of that. We rejoice because of that. God doesn't care whether you're rich or poor. He really doesn't. All He cares about is whether you have opened up your life to Him. He wants to be the source of joy in your life. But you must listen to Him and do something about what He is telling you. The question I'm leaving you with is, will you follow God's leading today? Will you follow God's leading today? If you do, you will find more than you ever bargained for. Don't miss out on the treasure of Christ in your life today. He's looking for you right now. Are you going to follow what he's leading today? I'd like for us to stand. And as we sing.